This video is brought to you by Botsu. Hop on over to the link in the description to get your hands on not only some truly traditional Japanese snacks, but learn about the culture and peoples who make them. Hey everyone, Gaichin Boomba here, and welcome back to another episode of Witch Ninja, a series that looks at media's most popular shinobi to see which are good and which are bad. Alright guys, I don't think it should be a surprise to anyone that this video was coming. Ever since Ghost of Tsushima's announcement in 2017, we've had request after request to analyze the seemingly ninja designs and tactics of the game's titular ghost himself, Jin Sakai. And between the gameplay footage of E3 2018 all the way to the 18 minute gameplay showcase back in May, theoretically we could have cobbled something together for a witch ninja analysis. Heck, it may have done completely gangbusters compared to this video, considering how much hype there was surrounding the game, and with good reason. But rather than jump the gun, I wanted to take everything, and I do mean everything, into consideration with this game. Because what started off as three pages of ninja analysis notes turned into seven. Ah, but there's the rub. Can we even call Jin a ninja? I mean, throughout the game- Oh, right, sorry. Spoiler warning, everyone. We're gonna be getting into some minor plot points with this analysis video, so if you haven't played the game and want that sweet satisfaction of story, come on back later. But yeah. Throughout the entirety of this story, Jin is never once referred to as a ninja, shinobi, or even some of the more obscure terms like musubito, dappa, or supa. Instead, in English he's called the ghost, and in Japanese he's called the kurodo, which has more of a meaning of a dark shadowy person. Well, that's the funny thing about Jin being the ghost. He's more like this weird kind of proto-ninja. Like, all of his ninja abilities we see in-game feel either after the fact, like the devs wanted to put in these shinobi tropes in the game first, or the circumstances are just so perfect that it feels more than a little coincidental that Jin's ghost abilities mirror so closely to shinobi, which either way isn't bad at all as far as I'm concerned. But by and large, Jin is pushed into shinobi-like strategies not because of years of training within some clan or time-honored family of secret agents, but rather the need to do what he must to survive and protect Tsushima to get the job done, which in turn gets him in a hot water with his uncle who chastises his behavior as dishonorable. <sighs> give me a break. Even as far back as the late 1200s when this game takes place, daimyo and warlords had been using spies and agents for hundreds of years. How do I know this? Because in game, Jin talks about his required reading of Sun Tzu's The Art of War, a text that theoretically all samurai had to study. And in The Art of War, Sun Tzu spends a great amount of time talking about the importance of spies and intel gathering, which in turn became the core foundation of shinobi strategy of the Bansen Jukais to be believed. So come on, Uncle Shimura, we all know that samurai employed shinobi no mono. Well, fair as that might be, we're not here to talk about culture and accuracies. That's for the inevitable second video I have planned for this game. For today, I'm rolling up my sleeves, cracking my knuckles, and breaking down everything from Jin's tools and abilities to his choice in fashion just to see how ninja he really is. But before we do, I gotta give a huge shout out to this video sponsor, Boksu. Why? Because this thing is basically the culture shock of Japanese snack boxes. Alongside each box that contains up to 25 snacks, depending on which kind of box you get, is a dozen or so page booklet of cultural information that fits the theme of each individual box. And for me personally, my most recent box was the Tokyo Summer. Now, Summer in Japan for me was all about festivals and matsuris, and boy did this box take me right back. With my personal favorites being the Puku Puku Thai Salted Watermelon Taiyaki, the Picola Chocolate Biscuit Wraps, the Yaki Tomorokoshi Corn Arare, and my absolute favorite, the Takoyaki Te Corn Puffs, all of which in appearance and taste took me right back to the summer matsuri food that I miss so dearly. Of course, that doesn't include the eight other kinds of snacks that this box came with. Plus the tea. Oh man, each one of these boxu boxes has its own unique tea to go with the wide selection of biteables. And as icing on the cake, you know those booklets that I was telling you about? Well, each one has its own unique blurbs of culture to match its theme. I'll be real with y'all. I've promoted these guys before and I'll be promoting them again because I absolutely love what this service offers. Classic snacks from Japan that you're not gonna get in stores, and fascinating culture snippets that come in each box. So if you want to sample these cultural snacks for yourself, head on over to the link in the description and use the code GAIJINTIN to get up to $44 off your order. Worldwide shipping is free and you can cancel at any time. So come take a literal bite out of Japan's culture. Alright, alright, I think they got the message. Now then, where in the world do we start with Jin's ninja tendencies? Easy! We start with the one thing that attaches Jin to ninja more than anything else in this game. Gunpowder! Consider this. The Mongol invasion of Tsushima in 1274, which is where and when this game takes place, is Japan's first ever experience with gunpowder. After Kublai Khan conquered and integrated the Song Dynasty into his empire, he also adopted China's gunpowder technology. 
And let me tell you, what started off as simple fireworks in 142 AD during the Han Dynasty had turned into a plethora of military hardware in the Tang Dynasty 600 years later. And just like in game, the Mongols brought with them not only their Thunder Crash bombs, known to the Japanese as Tetsuhao, but other explosive weapons such as the Chinese crafted siege catapults and the Huoqiang Fire Lance, a sort of proto fire own. All of which caught Japan's forces off guard having never experienced what kind of war tech this was. Which is why it feels so freaking convenient that our ghost, Jin Sakai, finds himself using gunpowder technology to craft some of the most well known fire based weapons in the Shinobi arsenal. Yeah, no joke. Half of the so-called ghost tools you get in-game exist purely because Mongols brought over gunpowder, which Jin then R&Ds into some of the most recognizable shinobi tools found in old shinobi texts, such as the Bansen Chukai, Shoninki, and Shinobi Hiden. So, first things first, let's start with the oldest of these tools, the firecrackers, or as the shinobi called them, Hyakuraichu. On pages 191 and 219 of the Bansen Chukai, there's extensive talk about how the Hyakuraichu were to be used. In the case you are 14 or 15 kin or even 20 kin away from the enemy, or if you are closer and are hiding by using Uzura Gakure Quail Hiding and the enemy cannot find you and they are running around in the area, then here you should light Hyakuraiju firecrackers in a bush or a thicket or an abandoned hut or house. By doing this, the enemy will think that a night attack squad is there and rush to intercept it while you evade and retreat. Which, yeah, as an evolution of the wind chime ghost tool that can lure one enemy away so you can sneak by in game, the firecrackers attract upwards of five different enemies to go check out a location, allowing you either to sneak by where they were facing, or, my personal favorite, using it as a lure to then blow the crap out of them with a black powder bomb. Yeah, let's rap about those bombs for a hot sec. In game, we have both an artistic depiction and a tooltip, as well as a 3D model on what the black powder bomb looks like which is little more than a middle splitting casting tied around twice over with a rope with a simple wick coming out of the top. Which, yeah, this is exactly what Shinobi made Horokihia hand grenades looks like. A split clay ball filled with pockets of gunpowder and iron fillings with a fuse placed in the center with ignition powder, then tied tight to keep the internal sealed. Pretty accurate, right? Yeah, it's just kind of funny because Mongolian thunder crash bombs or Tetsuhao did not look like this. Heck, none of their bombs did. Unlike these clay affairs, the Tetsu Hao, as the name implies, was a hand grenade made from iron filled with powder and iron shavings to add to the shrapnel. And while Mongols did have a few kinds of pottery-based explosives, they were all spiked or dimpled, exactly the same as the explosives we see in Jin's hideout around one of his workstations. Jin isn't just looting and using Mongol explosives, he's modifying them into something brand new, something eerily ninja. On the topic of explosives, we also have Jin's point-blank smoke bombs. With a quick toss on the ground, it allows the ghost to either get away and hide, or quickly assassinate staggered enemies. A small part of a widely used noroshi no jutsu or smoke concealment technique used by Shinobi no Mono, which actually focuses on a shinobi using smoke to get in somewhere rather than getting out. Something not only capable with the smoke bomb in-game, but a technique that Jin himself utilizes by mixing gunpowder in a local temple's incense burners in order to create a smoke screen for quick assassination entries. But anyway, back to smoke bombs. While standard Tori and Noko smoke bombs were typically made using small egg-sized casings that required a lit fuse, impact smoke bombs like the ones that Jin used weren't as difficult to make as you might think. A base of gunpowder for the explosion, magnesium for the impact trigger, and finally a bit of sugar to make a thick white smoke is typically all you really needed. Wrap it up in a flammable package and BOOM! Impact smoke bomb. Lastly, when it comes to underhanded tricks, the last of Jin's arsenal is the stereotypical kunai. Which, as we've discussed many times before, the kunai was a digging tool first and the thrown weapon second. But here's the thing. When we think shuriken, we typically think pronged or spiked flat star oriented throwing weapons, right? Well, the fact of the matter is, shuriken were far more than just thrown tiny wheels. In fact, I'd argue that there are just as many knife pointed long shuriken variations as there are rounded variations, many of which taking on the appearance of miniaturized kunai. So while the name may be misleading, the size and physics are not. <laughs> That's not the only thing that's misleading. The art of using shuriken, or shuriken jutsu as it was called, was not a ninja only technique. Rather, shuriken jutsu was more used by the samurai class, so I fail to see why the chucking of blades is such a dishonorable act. Moving right along, we come to the way of the flame technique, which sounds like some kind of mystic ability passed down through the generations, which yeah, is what the game presents it to be, but mechanically speaking, it's little more than dumping flaming oil on your sword and then using it as a way to quickly hack down a big group of enemies with unblockable attacks. Which, I'm not even joking, I found a reference to in the Bansen Shukai completely by accident. 
I was doing research for hand grenades when on page 437 under Ninki 5 Ninja Tools 5, I found a recipe for quote, fire to be put on the end of a spear when fighting a large number of enemy soldiers, and I was in shock! Look, I know a spear isn't a sword, but fire on a pointy stick is fire on a pointy stick. Not so much a one-to-one -one connection for sure, yet it's technically identical. Uh, nothing better than finding a good bit of cultural trivia completely at random. And that's just the quick throw items. We still have all of Jin's projectile weapons to cover. What, like the fire and explosive arrows? Haven't we basically analyzed those into the ground in previous videos by now? Well, when it comes to basics, perhaps, but something I do want to look into is not only how these arrows functioned, but also how they were constructed. Because not only have I found a bit more information in my research text, but with the advent of just how freaking detailed this game is, I feel like I can finally start doing some microanalysis. So, fire arrows. Seems simple, right? You just set an arrow on fire and launch. But how does one exactly do that? And more specifically, how did Shinobi do it? For actual construction of Hia fire arrows, the most simplistic way I've seen is the soaking of rags in oil, then binding them not to the arrowhead, but a little ways down the shaft, keeping them primed and capable of burning for much longer periods of time rather than just dry kindling or lighting the arrow itself on fire. And what do we have in game? An arrow wrapped in cloth, mounted a bit below the arrowhead, and covered in oil. And for those of you who may want to try to claim that this gray substance is more of a gunpowder, well, let's just say that oil rag soaking wasn't the only way a ninja had to make hard-burning flaming arrows. Then there's the explosive arrows, known as bakuretsuya, which were a bit more nuanced, because it's one thing to make an arrow burn, but it's another to blow it up. Despite this, though, different shinobi pulled this off in somewhat different ways. Based on the examples that I've seen, some would use cuts of bamboo to act as a cylinder for packing powder, while others would use iron casings for a bit of extra shrapnel. Heck, in some cases, Shinobi arrows had a massive diamond-shaped casting to maximize the amount of powder that could be held without adding too much drag to the arrow. And when it comes to Ghost of Tsushima, we have that exact same diamond-shaped iron charge on the arrow. Alright, well, fire and explosions are great and all, causing a lot of panic and a wide range of destruction, but what about the more silent but deadly approach? What about poisoned arrows? Good question. Though poison arrows aren't their own item in the game, you can spec all arrows with certain charms to have a percentile poison proc which instantly kills enemies. This is not so unlike Dokuya, shinobi-styled poison arrows. But unlike most other sneaky types who would coat the arrowhead with toxin, Dokuya, similar to the Hia, would have scraps of poison-soaked cloth tied near the head of the arrow, allowing the poison to seep in right behind the arrow's piercing wound. This, I assume, helped prevent accidental self-poisoning should the archer nick himself with a poison arrowhead. But considering the poison cloth has to make an impact behind the wound rather than just the wound itself, the percentile chance of actually poisoning someone would be quite a bit lower. Just like it is in-game! Alright, alright. With all this poison talk, we gotta talk about the Fukia Jutsu, or Blowpipe a ninja tool that we've actually never talked about in this show. Yeah, funny that, because out of all of the shinobi's projectiles, this one's got to be the most creative. I mean, sure, just like in-game where Jin constructs his blowgun from reeds, ninjas could create perfectly functioning blowpipes from, well, just about anything pipe-shaped, but a good number of shinobi opted in to camouflage their bowgun as a shakuhachi, a thick, long bamboo flute that, yes, even our boy Jin plays. Kept functional by using internalized paper to cover the finger holes when the instrument of music needed to be an instrument of death. Ah, uh, but what good is a blowgun without an accompanied poison? In-game, Clan Sakai's old housekeeper, Yuriko, helps Jin develop two insanely powerful poisons. The upchucking pure assassination poison made from wolfsbane, and a hallucinogenic poison that causes enemies to go ballistic, attacking anything, including each other. Using poison from spider lilies. How accurate is that? Believe it or not, surprisingly so. In fact, some of the shinobi research material that I have mentions this exact flower by name. Wolfsbane, or Torikabuto as it's called in Japan, is insanely toxic, especially its roots and its seeds, just as it's explained in-game. Though also as it's told in-game, Wolfsbane's deadliness is a little inconsistent based on its dosage. Just how Yuriko tells Jin that the poison needs to be more concentrated work on people, in real life, a 20 to 40 milliliter tincture of Wolfsbane's aconitine toxin is almost instantaneously fatal with initial symptoms being vomiting, nausea, and diarrhea, followed closely by burning in the gastrointestinal organs. All symptoms poison enemies show in-game between the blow dart poison Jin uses and his poisoning of the Mongols' milk. Now, hallucination caused by spider lily poison? Yeah, that's more fiction than fact. Granted, spider lilies, even yellow spider lilies that we see in-game, are in fact poisonous, 
Their bulbs contain alkaloid poisons that reduce blood pressure to dangerous levels, inhibit protein synthesis, and cause as many of the same above-mentioned symptoms as wolfbane. But while spider lilies have alkaloids like lycarine and tazetine, it lacks psychoactive alkaloids like mescaline. Alright, so that's all the weapon-oriented shinobi tools in Jin's repertoire, but how many non-combative tools are there? Not many, but there are a few definitely worth mentioning. One of which, any fan of Witch Ninja will know right off the bat. I mean, it's even retained its Japanese name in the English version of the game. I call it the Kaginawa. Known for being one of the Shinobi no Rokugu, or six critical ninja tools, the Shouninki has this to say about the tool under the Shinobu Idetachi no Narai. Quote, The Kaginawa grappling iron is used to climb up or descend from a height, to grapple or restrain and tie someone up, to lock a sliding door, and for many other purposes not mentioned here. So what you're saying is, while Jin is using the Kaginawa for its most basic use, he's actually handicapping himself by not using it more outside the box. Huh, that's interesting. What else is there? Well, it's a bit of a stretch, but the focused hearing ability in-game that allows you to see enemies behind walls, presumably because you're focused on listening to their movement, is very similar to the Kikizutsu, a hand-sized funnel pressed against the wall allowing the ninja to estimate how many people are in a room and where they're moving around. Finally, and I am so sad this did not become an in-game tool, there is the Horagai, a large conch shell predominantly used by Yamabushi and Buddhist monks for religious ceremonies, a shell that we see support protagonist Norio, a warrior Buddhist monk, carry around with them. Now in-game, Jin reminisces how Norio was going to teach him how to play the Horogai, allowing the two to signal each other across the island, which, fun fact, is exactly what ninja used them for. And considering Yamabushi and Buddhist monks made up two of the Shichi Hode, the seven usual disguises for the shinobi, it made its use as a signaling tool even less conspicuous to everyday people. Good grief, that was a lot. Freaking took well over our usual 10 minute time frame to get through all of that. Well, don't get comfortable, we still have Jin's attire and tactics to go over. Hey, it's just one piece of the ninja pie, and it really does speak volumes on how just close to history and folklore Jin sits with Shinobi. But for the sake of brevity, because lord knows we need it, we're just gonna look into Jin's iconic ghost armor set. Which, curious enough, is two different kinds of armor depending on how far you upgrade it. Yeah, I thought it was really weird that Jin's ghost armor started off as one thing and then transformed into something completely different. Well, let's break the two down and see how one may very well evolve into the other. The Ghost Armor's first iteration seems little more than a thick linen affair with a bit of chain going down the padded Haidate. From my research, this gives off the air of a standard Kusari Katabita set of armor, typically embroidered with small black link chain providing very basic protection. However, around the shoulders, chest, and arms of Ghost Armor Mark I are what look like stitched on coins, which, come on, what sense would highly reflective metal make for a stealth suit? But I came to find out that it wasn't unusual for Shinobi to stitch 12th century coins into apron-like chest pieces for similar protection. Considering this armor was canonically made by Jin's blacksmith friend Taka, and not a professional armorsmith, this jank makes sense. Though unlike Jin, the coin-based Kusari Katabira was typically worn underneath the clothing. But it's the Mark II and by extension Mark III designs where things really get interesting. Where before there were stitched coins, now there are segment plates of armor along the arms and the haidate, strikingly similar to Shinobi Kachu, plated armor that was interlinked with the above-mentioned small black chain, and was very popular with Shinobi in combat due to the armor's ability to be folded and be highly portable. But that's not all. Jin also seems to have external and internal storage lined throughout his entire attire, some more obvious than others. This mirrors an aspect of the Shinobi Shouzoku that we've never really covered before. Pockets. Ninjas had more pockets on their person than an in-cap of flight cargo shorts. This is very true. Over half a dozen square pockets could line the inside of the shinobi's uagoromo, carrying everything from handheld weapons to utility items or just extra hiding space for ninjas' nicked goods. While the teko arm guards and kyahan leg guards could hold pockets for long slender tools like bow shuriken, lock picks, or small drills, to which the ghost armor's teko looks like the armor plating could be holding long pockets underneath. Now, aside from the coverings of the body, we also have Jin's ghost headband and mask. The metal-plated headband, also known as the Hachigane, is really nothing too special to write home about. These were typically smaller and easier to produce cranial protection for low-level samurai and ashigaru, so for a shinobi to pick it up and use as part as their regular garb doesn't seem so out of the ordinary. But then we've got Jin's mask, the atypical samurai mempo, not only effectively protecting one's face, but also creating a terrifying visage. Ah, uh, you mean the exact mechanic that the ghost armor gives the player. Well, yes, but not just that. Samurai would capitalize on all matter of Mempo to appear more vicious on the battlefield. Despite what Uncle Shinma says, fear is a weapon. A weapon that even the most honorable samurai capitalized on, 
I mean, heck, just ask Sensei Ishikawa. But the difference between standard samurai and Jin shinobi strategies is while the samurai were trying to look like fearsome creatures of legend, Jin became a fearsome creature of legend. I mean, for crying out loud, it wasn't even an in-game week and already we have people spreading rumors that the ghost is over 10 feet tall with eyes like a demon. Verbatim. Well, when you consider the ghost dance mechanic in the game and how you capitalize on the established fear of the ghost by Mongols to get an easy three kills, it kind of makes sense. Well, I mean, that's my point. Jin isn't the first mass shinobi to use folk stories to his advantage. During the Heian period, General Fujiwara in his rebellion against the government employed four demons of the elements, Kaki, Ongyoki, Doki, and Tsuiki, capable of manipulating the elements. But these four demons were little more than proto-shinobi that used ninjutsu to appear magical and otherworldly, creating their own legacy as fearsome, unstoppable demons, just like what Jin has done. More info on that piece of history in the Zuko video we did a ways back. And this is far from the only shinobi tactic Jin capitalizes on in this game. Now, I brought up in that previously mentioned Zuko video that the Bonsen Shukai states that there are historically speaking two forms of infiltration that Shinobi capitalized on, Inin and Yonin. Inin being the process of sneaking in without being seen, and Yonin being the process of sneaking in in plain sight, disguises and such. Now, while Jin spends 95% of this game capitalizing on Inin tactics, there is one set of armor that allows him to pull off some crazy Yonin, the Mongol Commander Armor. This set of armor is by no means easy to get, but once you do, you can literally just walk through Mongol camps. As long as you don't do anything suspicious, you can walk straight into a Mongol camp, loot the entire place, kill the commander, and Zoidberg your way out. Just like Shinobi of old did. Granted, real Shinobi had a huge list of tactics for behaving like the enemy as well as dressing like them, and here you're just sauntering around no problem, but the principle's the same. Yeah, if this seems all a little too simple to be real, don't worry, you're gonna get an earful of Yoni details in the Zuko Part 2 video. Aside from that, let me just wrap up this video with a handful of other broad shinobi tactics Jin uses that mirror what we understand history of shinobi to be. For example, Jin's basic use of the Suito no Jutsu, a series of Chiton Jipo techniques that utilizes water for escape. Whether it be pushing a rock into a body of water to convince pursuers you jumped in, or hiding in a body of water for long periods of time using weights and breathing reeds, it's a small thing in game, but it's very classically ninja. And let's not forget Jin's tendency to capitalize on Jinto Jipo, techniques that use people or animals to sow chaos. For example, setting a bear loose on a Mongol camp to distract and attack enemies, very much a Juton Jutsu. Or blasting an arrow into a wasp nest to sting the ever loving crap out of unwitting baddies, a technique very much capitalized on by ninja under the Chuton Jutsu. I mean, even Jin's scripted plans of infiltration are ninja's head. During the story mission The Iron Hook, the mission where Jin obtains the Kaginawa, he goes through his plan of infiltrating Fort Yatete, a fortification atop a cliff face. Jin decides to climb up the cliff face and enter the fort from behind. A simple plan, right? Well, it also is a textbook plan of the shinobi. In the Bonsen Shukai under Volume 12 Enin 2, if a shinobi was infiltrating a castle, it should be, quote, by a steep area if it's a mountainside castle or castle on a hill. Which is exactly what Jin does, because there isn't a much deeper area than a cliff face for a fort on a hill. Finally, and I know I've mentioned it a dozen times on the show by now, but the game made a tooltip about it, so we're covering it. The Tanuki Gakure no Jutsu, a technique named after Japan's only tree climbing canid and built around the simple concept that humans rarely look above a 45 degree angle line of sight, allowing shinobi to hide or position themselves more effectively. Lordy, all that and not once is Jin called a ninja, shinobi, or otherwise. Believe it or not, that's actually the most prominent thing about Jin being a true ninja, if you ask me. Right now, there's a lot of debate about the legitimacy of different ninja historical documents that I mentioned earlier. Several historians believe that ninja were not an individual organization of spies and assassins, but rather they themselves were samurai or ashigaru that simply executed intel gatherings or sabotage missions. Thus, I've been asking myself time and time again, is Jin the samurai actually a ninja? For a lot of people, and especially for popular media, shinobi are groups and clans of isolationalist individuals who spend their lives to develop the ninja profession, so to speak, from generation to generation. Clans of spies hired out by different daimyo to do underhanded work. But to me, that's not what a ninja is. In my three years of studying shinobi, using everything from translated text to getting primary information from Japan itself, if there is anything that I learned about ninja, it's that they are the absolute kings of endurance. When we see the kanji for ninja or shinobi, we associate the core kanji as to sneak or be stealthy. But this kanji's meaning is also read as endurance or survival. Did ninja know how to take out a person quickly? Yes. Did ninja know how to be stealthy? Sure. 
But above all else, in every single document I've ever read, in every interview I've ever listened to, Ninja above all else were about survival. About doing whatever it took to get the mission done. They were the country's greatest creative critical thinkers. Capitalizing on new technologies, chemical discoveries, and psychoanalyses to go in, get the job done, and get out. Everything that history tells of them proves this. From the wilderness survival techniques that they learned, to the modern tech weapons they used and created, to the intricate ways they manipulated human behavior, I believe that is what it means to be truly ninja. Now look at Jin. Look at his actions. The conversations he has in game. Jin makes his own tools. Jin capitalizes on new technologies that the Mongols bring to cripple Japan. Jin utilizes the tales of fear surrounding the ghost. Jin speaks of doing what he has to to protect Tsushima. Jin acknowledges the new tricks and strategies that are key for defeating the Mongols. Jin is Shinobi. In fact, he's the purest concentration of it in media. It doesn't matter whether or not he came from some clan or was under some sensei's tutelage. He was a warrior who needed to change tactics from head-on combat to ambush guerrilla warfare using every resource available to him. Throwing knives to stagger his enemies, newfound gunpowder technology which brought new methods for maximizing damage and confusion, to execute his mission and get out alive. This is Shinobi Warfare. In-game, the way of the samurai was a stagnant, predictable, and easy thing to deal with. But the ghost? The ghost was unpredictable, smart, and resourceful. Using strategy and technology to bend the circumstances, blocking his goals of infiltration, intel gathering, and assassination to Jin's favor. As far as I'm concerned, that is what a true shinobi is. And that is why I love and obsess over them so. They show just how powerful an individual can be when they're resourceful, creative, and fearless. Thanks for watching, everyone. Let me give one last big thank you to Boxu for sponsoring this video. And don't forget, if you want a taste of true Japan for yourself, click that link in the description and use the code GAIJIN10 to get up to $44 off your purchase. Take a literal bite out of Japan's culture. Likewise, if you like this kind of content, sub up, get notified, and be sure to check out our next video, The Long-Awaited Witch Ninja Part 2 of Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender. You won't want to miss it. And be sure to swing by our Twitch streams every Tuesday, Saturday, and Sunday at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time. But until next time, everyone, this is Gaijin Goomba, signing out.